developed that's uh, translational in nature. And why don't we go ahead and go to the next slide. I don't have any uh, conflicts of interest to disclose. And with regard to what causes autism, uh, we don't know very much, as, as everyone on the, on the webinar knows. Uh, certainly there are some genetic uh, findings that might uh, account for 10 or 15 percent of those with uh, autism spectrum disorder, but by and large we don't know much about uh, the, the cause of idiopathic autism. Next slide. There are a number of reasons why conducting research in uh, autism are challenging. And throughout the years, investigators have sought uh, different clinical features that might be used to uh, distinguish meaningful subtypes of autism. Uh, and, and the majority of these approaches haven't uh, proven to be that helpful. And one of the reasons is that there are so many different behavioral symptoms associated with autism, certainly the core symptoms that we've come to recognize as social impairment, impaired communication, and repetitive uh, phenomena are there. And then these uh, individuals can also have lots of associated symptoms. So having an ASD doesn't protect you from having the onset of other neuropsychiatric disorders. Uh, intellectual disability is uh, a factor in, in many of our patients. So because of the um, heterogeneity of the clinical presentation, it's been very difficult to identify uh, meaningful clinical subtypes, which we would, would hope would then uh, allow us to search for identifiable causes of autism. Next slide. And this again is uh, along the same lines that uh, in DSM-4, uh, as you know, we had five different subtypes of pervasive developmental disorder. And there was a hope that with um, autistic disorder, Asperger's disorder, and PDD-NOS, uh, this might again be an approach that would lead to uh, meaningful clinical subtypes that would have uh, more unique uh, biological underpinnings. And we know that in DSM-5, um, these subtypes have been removed, and now we have autism spectrum disorder uh, that can then be uh, subclassified based on a level of severity. So as the, the diagnostic uh, terms for the disorder have changed over the years. I think there have been these different attempts to uh, try to make it easier to sort these things out. But, but, but honestly, uh, nothing has proven uh, helpful so far. Next slide. So one uh, paper that I tend to read at least once a year is Leo Connor's original uh, paper that he uh, that was titled Autistic Disturbances of Affect Affective Contact. And this was published in a journal called Nervous Child back in 1943. And I encourage each of you to uh, get a copy of this paper and read it. Uh, there are 11 descriptions of cases of children with autism in there. They're really the best descriptions that I've ever seen. If you can't find uh, the paper, uh, email me and I'm happy to send you an electronic copy. Um, but once a year I go back and read this because I, it, it certainly informs um, my ideas regarding clinical research and I learn something new each time I reread the paper. Next slide. So a couple of years ago I went back and reread uh, the paper, and a number of things jumped out at me from the, the different cases. And on that particular read, the things that were getting my attention were related to, uh, possibly related to uh, immune dysfunction or immune-mediated uh, symptoms. So we see here that 
Uh, and these are all things that you've noticed uh, working with patients clinically, but when you see these things uh, occurring repeatedly throughout the cases, it begins to uh, get your attention. So the need for frequent changes of formula, uh, the mother having kidney difficulty during the end stages of pregnancy, the patient with large and ragged tonsils. Uh, here's a case three, following small packs smallpox vaccination at 12 months, the patient had an attack of diarrhea and fever from which he recovered. Again, we have large tonsils and adenoids. Next slide. In case four, you know, frequent vomiting and regurgitation, with which we often see uh, the need for changing uh, formulas, in this case with little success, uh, tonsils being removed, a difficulty uh, nursing, uh, to the point where case five, uh, a female uh, quit taking any kind of nourishment, required tube feeding uh, up until the age of one year. Um, a vitaminosis and malnutrition. Next slide. This case six didn't have anything along these lines. Again, regurgitation and vomiting uh, early in life. Uh, difficulty with uh, formula. Um, then we have, you know, recurrent infection, colds, bronchitis, chickenpox, strep infection, uh, impetigo, et cetera. Um, the assurances of the pediatricians, uh, to the contrary, notwithstanding, insisted it was uh, rheumatic fever. Next slide. Then, then finally, we have hypothyroidism uh, being suspected, and then uh, difficulty with feeding again, uh, hospitalizations necessary for feeding problems, repeated colds and ear infections with necessitating uh, ear tube placement. Next slide. And again, someone that seemed to need thyroid preparations, and the, the father was described as a person with a thin person with nervous energy. It kind of wonder what his thyroid might be up to. So when I reread it on that occasion, um, things that were on my mind led me to uh, view different aspects of the cases in, in a certain way, and it reinforced um, some of our thinking that there may be immune-related uh, symptoms in um, at least some individuals with autism, and this would be dating back to uh, the early 40s. Next slide. Let's talk about um, a little bit of the, uh, the work that we've done regarding familial autoimmunity in autism. Next slide. And this is a study that um, we published a decade ago, and uh, I started seeing individuals with autism in the late 80s, and one of the things that began to strike me back then and that I continue to notice in my clinical work is having parents, when they give me a family history, a comment uh, often on autoimmune diseases that uh, occur in the family. Now, they would, they would rarely uh, mention these uh, autoimmune disorder, so I, I've learned to ask about them. And even if you ask the family if there are autoimmune disorders on either side, they'll sometimes say no, um, which is why you then need to describe the autoimmune disorders, and then they'll begin to resonate with you a little bit. Um, they, they don't always know what we consider to be autism. Uh, autoimmune disorders. So a number of years ago, we did a, a study, and I would say that it's, uh, it's the results are interesting, but it's certainly not a uh, well-designed study by any means, nor is there, uh, nor has there been uh, a well-designed study looking at autoimmunity in families uh, to date. Uh, but in this particular study, we took uh, 101 children with PDD, 101 uh, healthy control children, of same age, age matched, and 100 children that had known autoimmune disorders. And we gave their parents a uh, sheet uh, listing autoimmune disorders, and we asked them to tell us which of the probands, first and second degree relatives, had 
an autoimmune disorder and which one it might have been. And you can see here that if we just add up the number of family members, uh, relatives of, of the probe band that had an autoimmune disease, uh, it was much more likely to be found in the children with PDD, even more so than relatives of children with known autoimmune disorders and certainly more so than uh, healthy control children. So this was consistent with uh, some earlier studies that used a similar uh, methodology. Um, but one of the issues with this study design is, you know, we didn't actually interview the first and second degree relatives in person. Um, we didn't confirm that uh, these individuals had uh, autoimmune disorders if the parents listed them, for example, by looking at medical records. And we also didn't have a, a mechanism for determining if an individual had a, uh, an evolving subthreshold autoimmune uh, disorder. Uh, so if anything, uh, the results are, uh, of autoimmune disease were likely to be underreported. Next slide. In the same study, um, again, looking at, across the three groups, uh, you see these were a couple of autoimmune disorders that seem to be most prevalent. And you see uh, the, the differences, again, in the numbers between uh, PDD and healthy controls with regard to rheumatic-related disorders and um, hypothyroidism. So significantly different between the PDD group and the healthy control group. Another thing that we've learned over time is that as a person gets older, the likelihood of an autoimmune disorder uh, coming about increases. So when we studied uh, children uh, with PDD, there, there were likely to be a number of their relatives that hadn't yet passed through the, the age of risk. Um, so we, we utilized a number of the things we learned in our initial study in the design of the study I'm going to describe to you now. So we, we call this um, a Neuroinflammation Program Project Grant. And this is what um, many people would call a high-risk study uh, with, with respect to uh, the likelihood of uh, identifying anything. And um, this is the type of study that um, most uh, funding agencies are going to be hesitant to fund because uh, the, the likelihood of finding something is, is quite low. Uh, fortunately, um, we met uh, Bob and Donna Landreth uh, not long ago, and uh, Bob and Donna are the grandparents of a, uh, a, a young boy with uh, autism. Uh, that actually uh, lives in the United States, but not near here. And um, Bob and Donna wanted to do something uh, to further autism research. And this is a project that they uh, decided to fund. Next slide. So uh, the, the study is going to involve 100 uh, males with uh, autistic disorder, so they'll meet DSM-4 criteria for autistic disorder. Um, and um, you can see that we've increased the age range to those between the ages of 18 and 40 uh, so that more of the relatives uh, are likely to have uh, passed through the, the age of risk for the onset of autoimmune disorders. And we also have 100 age and gender matched uh, healthy males. And uh, our plan is to uh, determine if uh, first and second degree relatives uh, of the proband have autoimmune disorders. Now, when we calculated the number of people that were likely, likely to be um, uh, evaluating, it, it's uh, well over 2,000. So um, that, can, uh, that can result in a lot of time. Um, so we work with uh, some folks here that are uh, very 
uh, adept at uh, using uh, electronic uh, means of obtaining uh, information. So, uh, if next slide, please. So. Um, we've designed an autoimmune uh, symptom checklist that we'll be able to send to the relatives uh, electronically once we have their, they've given their consent. Uh, and asking these uh, questions, and there are two more pages of, whoops, um, let's see here, one second. Okay, there are, there are two more pages of, of these questions. Um, we'll be able to, uh, if you score certain points on the, on the questionnaire, it will tell us uh, if you're likely to have an autoimmune disorder, and if so, we'll then uh, work to confirm that by uh, looking at the person's medical records. And there's also a lower threshold that can be scored with the questionnaire that will uh, indicate that you may have a, an evolving or developing autoimmune disorder. And for those relatives, we'll actually bring them into the clinic and do a, a workup to, to rule out autoimmunity. So uh, th this will be an attempt to um, uh, uh, in increase the, uh, the, the accuracy of uh, of identifying autoimmune disorders in all first and second degree relatives. Next slide. And these are just some more of the questions uh, from the symptom checklist. And next slide. And and this is the following. So you'll you'll see that um, the the patients in probands. You've got them. You've got a hundred uh, adults with autistic disorder. You've surveyed the uh, first and second degree relatives of both groups. And the hypothesis is that there will be a, a subgroup of uh, those with autism uh, that has a higher uh, density of familial autoimmunity than uh, others with autism, as well as the uh, healthy control group. Uh, next slide, please. So, Remaining blind to the uh, results of the family autoimmune uh, survey, uh, we will then offer the uh, subjects with autism and the, the normal controls the, the opportunity to have a um, combined MRI PET scan. So you see here this uh, young man on the left, uh, it, Jacob Hooker, is, a, is in charge of the PET center at the Martino Center, which is a, a joint venture between uh, MGH and MIT. And Jacob um, uh, runs this PET MRI, which, which reportedly is the only one in existence. And Jacob is a chemist, and he has a, a, li a PET ligand that binds to microglia in the brain. So. Um, Next slide, please. And the, this ligand is called PBR28. Uh, so we can take these, uh, the individuals with autism and the healthy controls and do a combined PET MRI using the um, ligand that binds to microglia. And next slide. And thus far, we've um, scanned two adults with uh, ASD. This, this first man is 32 years of age. And um, these are all scans from his brain. And you can see that uh, there's uh, activity in the cerebellum, which is an area that's been implicated in, in autism, in the cingulate cortex. Cor uh, cortex the medial prefrontal cortex, uh, the thalamus, uh, and, and interestingly, the insula. Uh, and next slide. This is uh, the second um, adult subject with ASD that we've scanned. And, and he's 20 years old. And he, again, you see some, um, some areas that light up uh, in the cerebellum. Uh, 
the thalamus, the insula, um, so that there's some, some overlap in the first two subjects that we scanned. These are both uh, very high-functioning individuals that were able to uh, give uh, voluntary written informed consent. And uh, we're going to scan one additional such individual. And we're also um, doing the scans on age-matched uh, healthy controls. And um, this has been going fine. Uh, the, these patients have been able to, to hold very still uh, in the in the camera and um, be engaged in the in the in participating uh, and, and cooperating um, once we've scanned uh, the, the set first set of three with controls we're then um, going to attempt to to begin scanning uh, lower functioning individuals with uh, autism where we think that the, the likelihood of finding um, more uh, abnormality uh, will be in, increased. So we had the first part where the autoimmune questionnaire results are blind, we're blind to. Then a subset of those folks will have the a PET scan and will be blind to uh, the results of the PET scan. The next slide. We're then going to uh, uh, enroll uh, the subjects into an eight-week study, uh, double-blind placebo-controlled study of prednisone, which, as you know, is a uh, steroid. And uh, we thought a lot about uh, which type of anti-inflammatory agent to use, and some of them are more uh, specific uh, than others, and um, many of them are uh, quite uh, dangerous, if you will, uh, where, where we really don't have an idea uh, um, with regard to what particular areas of, of, um, the, of immune function are dysregulated in autism. So we wanted to have something that had a broad uh, coverage, if you will. Um, <laughs> and we also did, uh, we've done literature searches on anti-inflammatory approaches in, in autism. And, and there have been a number of reports uh, on the use of prednisone uh, in autism showing benefit, as well as in uh, disorders like Landau-Kleffner sy syndrome. We realize that some, some subjects may have an adverse response to prednisone and that you can't maintain treatment with prednisone for a long period of time due to the adverse events that are going to come about. So we're looking at this more as, uh, as an approach to try to get a signal on um, reducing symptoms of autism and with the hypothesis is that the, the patients that have he heightened familial autoimmunity who also show evidence of inflammation on the PET scan may show a, a better response to the drug. Next slide. We'll then repeat the PET MRI and see if um, patients that receive the active medication and uh, showed improvement have uh, a reduction or in the uh, degree of uh, uh, activation of their of their microglia. Next slide. In addition to having the human element component of the study that uh, I described, we have a, a preclinical component. And this is Bill Carlson, who uh, runs uh, one of the preclinical labs at McLean Hospital. And uh, next slide. Bill has uh, joined our group uh, in developing an animal model of autism uh, that's based on maternal inflammation. And this is a model that um, originally uh, began with Paul Patterson and his group at Caltech, and uh, Elaine Shaw has been involved in this work as well. So we take adult female mice and they become pregnant, and then we inject uh, poly IC, which uh, is a viral mimic, and the viral mimic results in inflammation in the uh, pregnant uh, female mouse, and when the the pups or the baby mice are born, uh, Bill and his group uh, characterize them behaviorally. And what's uh, 
been shown is that they have reduced vocalizations or communication, if you will, compared to um, saline injected uh, mothers that have pups. Uh, and the way we actually um, detect the vocalizations is with um, a, a, uh, a device that measures bat sounds. So it, you can't really hear the mice chatting um, with your typical ear, but with this uh, device that is able to sense uh, bat sounds, you can pick up some very sophisticated uh, measures that you can then analyze. Um, these mice are also uh, demonstrating reduced social interaction and increased repetitive behavior. Next slide. Then when we have these uh, pups, we can do all kinds of things that are sort of somewhat translational in nature. So we can actually take these pups born to the mothers where uh, the viral mimic was administered, and we can bring them over to the Martino Center and give them to uh, Jacob Hooker, and he can uh, do PET scans on the brains of the baby mice to begin looking for um, correlations between what we're seeing in the mice and, and what we're seeing uh, in the humans. And we're also uh, working with folks at McLean that can do electrophysiology on the, the baby mice. Uh, and, and we can look at um, to the level of the synapse with regard to excitatory and inhibitory uh, neurotransmission. Uh, we can also do gene expression studies on the, uh, the baby mice, the brains of the baby mice, uh, to see if uh, there's evidence of some of the, the genes that have been implicated in uh, causing autism. And then in addition to that, we can do uh, pharmacological ma manipulations to try to block or prevent the development of the, um, the behavioral symptoms in the pups uh, and try to reverse those symptoms in, in pups that have already acquired them. Uh, next slide. So that's a, a picture of the um, Massachusetts General Hospital. And uh, this is a listing of uh, all the, the members of the Lurie Center. The Lurie Center is a multidisciplinary clinic at Mass General uh, that we have uh, adult and child neurology, adult and child psychiatry, developmental pediatricians, pediatric gastroenterologists, adult internal medicine doctors, uh, neuropsychologists, speech, language, physical therapy, really everything that you need. Uh, under one roof, and um, I think that's uh, really what the model that uh, the ATN and ARP uh, strive for, and um, that's a listing of, of our, our group. Next slide. That's my email address. Please feel free to email me uh, questions, um, um, and um, I'll be happy to try to answer them. And we'll, we'll turn this back over to um, uh, Alex, I believe. Thank you so much, Dr. McDougall. Um, we're going to continue um, with Dr. Fasano's um, presentation. Um, Dr. Fas Alessio Fasano is the chief of the Division of Pediatric Gastroenterology and Nutrition here at Massachusetts General Hospital. Um, and he's also the director for the Center for Celiac Research, among other titles, including um, an affiliation as a visiting professor with Harvard Medical School. So Dr. Fasano, if you'd like to continue. Thank you, Alex. <clears throat> so I was given the task to discuss the matter of uh, whether or not um, autism spectrum disorder uh, have an autoimmune uh, nature and, and genesis. And again, uh, uh, some of these issues have been uh, touched upon by Dr. McDougall, and we're going to go a little bit more in details with the next slide. Um, if I can have the next slide. So um, in order to establish if indeed uh, autoimmune, um, autoimmunity is part of the pathogenesis of autism spectrum disorder, it would be worthwhile to really revisit the quote-unquote recipe for autoimmune disease. So in other words, which ingredients are necessary? Uh, since we don't have it, and, and, and definitely proof that autism is indeed an autoimmune disease like for diabetes and multiple sclerosis, we have to really build up a case, if you wish. So if you next, uh, where are the, the ingredients of this recipe? Next. 
definitely you need a, gen a, a genomic component. So you have to have, you know, genes that put you at risk to develop an autoimmune disease. And next, then you have to have um, an environmental trigger that is mismanaged by your immune system because of this genetic makeup. Uh, the next uh, ingredient is a, a, a gut barrier that doesn't work well anymore, so it allows these environmental, you know, instigators to come through and to be visible by the immune system. And uh, by definition, the immune system is an integral part of what is necessary to develop an autoimmune disease in order that this, the genome and the environment can interact. One recent ingredient that's been becoming more and more in interesting uh, next is the microbiome, uh, particularly the, the gut microbiome that seems to really impinge tremendously on the gut immune function. And all this together, these five elements, will eventually lead to a clinical outcome, in our case, uh, you know, autoimmunity. So I'm going to give you briefly these five ingredients, so where are the current uh, knowledge uh, about the uh, involvement in each of these uh, uh, factors uh, in autistic spectrum disorder to make up indeed the case that um, autism can indeed be considered autoimmune disease. Next slide. So, um, you know, the history of, uh, of autism, autistic spectrum disorder, is a re relatively recent one. It started for its recognition in the mid-40s, and then, uh, you know, the next two decades it was very fashionable, this uh, theory of the psychogenic risk factors. But it's in the 80s that with some uh, uh, instrumental uh, studies done on uh, um, twin uh, uh, brothers and sisters, uh, that indicated that definitely there was a heritable component of autism. And here, really, when genetics became uh, to be the focus of attention uh, in terms of the pathogenesis of autism. So it was already clear in the mid-'80s that indeed there was a genetic component. And then later on, uh, this genetic component interfaced with the environment, so we will see, you know, what this really entails. Next uh, slide. Uh, with the uh, solution of the human uh, genome, uh, with the Human Genome Project, it was completed, the capability to start to look at specific mutation of genes um, that can be involved with, with uh, specific pathologies, in this case autism. People start to do this uh, linkage, uh, you know, studies to find, you know, across the human, uh, you know, genome, where are the uh, genes and, and, and specific in which chromosomes these genes were located that seems to be as associated to uh, the uh, onset of autistic spectrum disorder. Here's the a map that now has been revisited. Now, this is almost uh, more than a decade old, uh, and each uh, red line represents a mutation on a specific gene of that specific micro uh, uh, chromosome. And you can see, interestingly, there are, you know, areas of a specific um, uh, chromosome, like, for example, the chromosome 7 and chromosome 16, in which there is a high abundance of um, mutation that, that link with, with autism. Again, all this to uh, reiterate the concept that, you know, there is a, definitely a genetic component in the pathogenesis of autism. Uh, with the next slide, um, you know, uh, this is summarized really the second element, so the environment. Why think people start to think that environment was important in the pathogenesis of autism? Well, again, Circumstantial evidence, no definite, you know, proof. Nevertheless, uh, there were, you know, uh, you know, this element seems to really make a, a point that the environment seems to be extremely important. So, uh, um, uh, n not just for autism, but for example, for neurodevelopmental disorder in general, there is an increased concern about the environmental exposure. Um, there is definitely uh, some provocative data on the mechanism by which the environmental exposure may cause autism, and, and Chris McDougall alluded to with this full IEC animal model to uh, maternal infection during pregnancy. Um, uh, there are definitely epidemiological data on environmental exposure and autism. Uh, definitely another, you know, circumstantial evidence that so far there's the lack of a most definitely genetic model for autism. In other words, make a single mutation or find the, the genetic makeup that, you know, uh, will definitely lead to autism with the only exception of fragile X that is responsible only for a subgroup uh, of uh, autistic cases. And finally, last but definitely not least, 
the, the descriptive labor of this uh, uh, epidemics of autism prevalence that we've been witnessing in, witnessing this in the last you know two decades that you know uh, in, in, in a relatively short period of time not long enough to advocate genetic mutation within the surge of prevalence of autism from one in five thousand to the current number one in eighty. Uh, so that's the reason why this, this increased focus on environmental exposure and autism. And among the, all the environmental uh, triggers to really capture, uh, you know, uh, the attention that also because are the most popular interventions that, uh, uh, you know, kids with autism are placed on, and these are gluten and casein. Next slide. Uh, these are the, uh, the two, uh, you know, environmental triggers that have been studied for a while. Uh, with some, I would say, controversial outcomes in which there is a lot of confusion, and we will figure out, uh, you know, at least I will give you some partial, you know, reason why there's been uh, this confusion. Next slide. Why gluten and casein? Well, for gluten, uh, the, the case is quite interesting. Gluten is the most abundant protein component of several uh, um, uh, grains, including wheat, rye, and barley, belong to this Drive that's called the Orly, that's the far left of this cartoon. Uh, now, um, you know, uh, what is interesting here in terms of uh, evolutionary biology, next, is the fact that the, the human species, for its 2.5 million years of evolution, had been 99.9% .9 gluten free. Indeed, the Orly, to which wheat, barley, and rye belongs to, came into the picture only 10,000 years ago when there was a dramatic change in lifestyle of, of our ancestors from nomadic, i.e. moving around, chasing food by season crops and, and animal migration to settlers. And well, that, they domesticate, you know, animals and crops, and that was the birth of agriculture. And with that, they start to put a point play with grains, and they develop grains containing gluten, and that's, you know, how this came about. That means that we as a species are not really apt to handle gluten right. Um, and therefore, a subgroup of us will eventually develop problems when exposed to, to, to wheat. Uh, next slide. The third element uh, that I'd like to discuss is this intestinal barrier. Um, there, there is a lot of uh, fantasies, very few facts about the role of intestinal barrier and antigen trafficking that can really lead to immune-mediated diseases uh, because, again, w the science is relatively new, even if this concept of the leaky gut, the leaky gut syndrome has been really conceptualized for a long time. It suffice to say that the spacing between cells that you see in this cartoon uh, that is depicted as the parasolar pathway was in the past conceptualized as a closed space, a seal to passage of anything. Uh, it's only in the last 25 years that we realized that this is actually is very dynamic space that can be modulated by opening and closing structures that are called tight junctions that can be considered a sort of doors that will open a shortcut from the environment, i.e. the lumen that you see at the top of that cartoon on the left-hand side, into the lamina propria, i.e. where the immune system is, uh, by opening this space in between uh, cells. Uh, the reason why we modulate this space is for, uh, you know, several, you know, uh, functions that we recently uh, discovered, in, in including uh, immune surveillance, um, modulate definitely immune function, uh, and, and regulate the exchange of small molecules uh, um, from the environment to our body. And the other thing that is coming more and more evident, and not just from alternative uh, and complementary medicine, but also from this, you know, the traditional streamline medicine, is that there's been a paradigm shift in terms of, you know, the pathogenesis of many immune-mediated diseases, particularly autoimmune disease, in which the dysfunction of this pathway, and therefore this opening of a shortcut in between cells, seems to be integral part of the pathogenesis of many autoimmune diseases, including celiac disease, type 1 diabetes, um, uh, multiple sclerosis, and plummer bowel diseases. One thing that we didn't know for a long time was how this uh, junction to this space is regulated. We had gained a lot of information about the structure of the side junction, but the how they are open and closed was really relatively, uh, you know, unknown to us until almost a decade ago when this molecule that's called zonulin was discovered to be so far still the only physiologic regulator that uh, will uh, uh, induce this tight junction to loosen up and therefore allow 
uh, stuff to come through. The next slide. What is interesting, going back to the mapping of the human genome and where the SNPs for the mutations are for several autoimmune diseases, is that the gene encoding zonulin next is sitting on chromosome 16. That is definitely one of the most, uh, you know, uh, crowded, so to speak, uh, you know, uh, uh, chromosomes in terms of mutations related to autism. And again, what is also interesting that this uh, zonulin is it's, it's a very ancient, you know, um, uh, protein. Uh, but interesting enough, that evolutionists speaking, only humans produced zonulin, while you know other animals, including our first cows and chimpanzees, they do not. Uh, next slide. Um, and again, what is interesting is, is that, you know, on chromosome 16, next, uh, there are, you know, uh, genes related to many diseases that can be divided in three major categories, autoimmune disease, cancer, and first into into this discussion, diseases in the nervous system, including, again, uh, autism and MS. And many, many investigators since the discovery zone have been uh, looking at you know, this protein as a biomarker for specific diseases next. And they also are categorized in these three major groups, uh, uh, including diseases in the nervous system, in which there is an association with MS and schizophrenia. And lately, there have been a couple of, uh, you know, uh, papers published that zona seems to be related to autistic spectrum disorders as well. So um, this is, again, next to say that, again, uh, th 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 there is a link, so to speak, uh, between environmental triggers uh, and uh, 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 intestinal permeability due to the fact that there are specific molecules that cause zonal release from the environment and therefore can cause the loss of this matter function on a, on a specific genetic background. Among the others, next, it happened to be just gluten, the one that's been studied the most, a matter of fact, those two peptides that you see color in blue have been identified and mapped uh, as component of this toxic element of gluten that's called gliadin to be capable to communicate with the mucosal of the intestine to instruct the intestine to release zonulin. And doing that, opening the shortcut for this molecule to come through and eventually to gain access into our body. Uh, next slide. Interestingly enough, this is a mechanism that is not peculiar for kids with autism or severe disease or any other immune disease, but we all have this mechanism that is operating. And now the evidence seems to suggest that this happened mainly because gluten is mistakenly interpreted by our immune system as a component of microorganism and therefore activate those cascade of events that we typically activate to get rid of infections. So by mistake, when we eat gluten that is digested, because of the nature of gluten that cannot be completely digested, so there are some fragments that are undigested, including the ones that communicate with the enterocytes to release zonulin. And with that, we open the space in between cells, allowing these molecules that you are depicting this cartoon as this white spot to come through and gain access into our body, and specifically the lamina propria where the immune system sits. So that means that everybody that eats gluten have a problem with the a, a leakiness of the gut. However, the vast majority of people would not even know that this happened because the immune system is apt to clean up this, uh, uh, you know, access of non-self antigen, and therefore we win this battle and everything is fine, and we don't even know that this happened. And also because in the vast majority of us, this uh, um, release zone and open side junction is something that has occurred a very short period of time and very shortly go back to baseline. While there are conditions in which this uh, uh, gate, I decide junction, got stuck open for much longer than it was supposed to, and that leads to problems if you're genetically skewed, including for what we understand about autism. Indeed, next slide, there have been studies that have been published relatively recently showing that uh, the permeability of the gut, in this case measured by this double sugar test, the lactose manacle test, uh, it's much higher in the autistic kids you see on, on the left part of the panel um, as compared to uh, kids' children controls, and also, interestingly, in their relatives compared to adults' controls. And this increase in permeability uh, seems to be corrected when these kids are placed on a gluten-free, casein-free diet that uh, 
ameliorated this increased permeability, bringing the permeability of the gut back to what is uh, similar to uh, normal kids. All this to say that it looks like that in autistic kids there is a defective intestinal barrier that can be partially uh, corrected by placing these kids on a gluten-free kids and free diet. Uh, with the next slide, there is another paper that also been recently published showing that by opening these shortcuts, uh, there is a, an increased access to non-self antigen, including gliadin, uh, casein, and uh, you will see this on the left and, and side of this panel. That means that non-self antigen, they come through, they are seen by the immune system, and they really trigger the immune response. Uh, that, that you see this level of anti gliding antibodies, anti casein antibodies in the serum of these kids. But when they go on a gluten free, casein free diet that is left hand side of the, the, the panel, all these antibodies goes back to the normal uh, levels that is very comparable to healthy control uh, kids. Uh, on the right hand side, you see a similar situation with the total Ig and milk derived Ig that are elevated uh, you know, in artistic kids, but go back to baseline when they go um, on a casein-free, gluten-free diet. Um, next slide. So talking still about this other component, the immune response, now it's known that among the immune response there are really marker of an autoimmune uh, you know, pathogenesis is the one that in, in trigger this uh, uh, branch of the immune response is called the TH17. Uh, immune response. In other words, when this TH17 immune response is triggered, a specific cytokine, and it's called interleukin 17, IL-17, is produced. And that is a good proxy for an autoimmune response. This paper that was published a couple of years ago shows that autistic patients compared to controls, they have a significant elevation in the serum uh, level of IL-17. And most interestingly, this elevated uh, uh, you know, serum level seems to be really associated to the severity of the condition. Indeed, in severe autistic kids compared to the mild and moderate autistic kids, they have a much higher level of uh, uh, serum IL-17, at least in the subgroup of them. So that's another you know, piece of the puzzle that seems to point toward the autoimmune uh, nature of, uh, of autistic spectrum disorder. Uh, the next, le next slide shows another interesting, uh, you know, information uh, that has to do with uh, the levels of vitamin D. Now, vitamin D, is, we all know, that is extremely important for the health of our bones, but also instrumental for the uh, capability of the immune system to protect against our immunity. And there are several evidence that low vitamin, serum vitamin D levels are strongly associated with increased risk of autoimmunity. And it is, uh, um, you know, uh, slide on the left-hand side panel, you see the levels of serum uh, uh, of vitamin D of healthy controls compared to autistic patients, and you see that autistic patients, the levels are significantly lower than in healthy control. Uh, also interesting in this study, um, they look at the uh, production of specific autoantibodies. There are these anti-myelin-associated glycoproteins that attack the myelin and therefore can affect, you know, uh, neurological and behavioral, you know, performances, and they found in this uh, patient, compared to control, a significantly higher level of these autoantibodies. And interesting, in the, in the third panel on the far uh, right hand side, they look so a, 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 a direct correlation between uh, an inverse correlation between the level of vitamin D and these autoantibodies, so the lower was the vitamin D, the higher were the level of these autoantibodies. Again, another piece of the puzzle suggesting that indeed we're dealing with an autoimmune uh, process here. The next slide, I believe that this is also even more compelling. This is a paper that was published last year in which uh, these others found in the uh, serum of kids, uh, autistic kids uh, specific antibodies against neuronal progenitors. So now we're talking about, you know, stem cells in the brain that seems to be specifically attacked and recognized by these autoantibodies against these neuronal progenitor cells uh, that uh, are specifically picking up, uh, you know, this, this cell. So again, another piece of evidence that we're dealing with, um, you know, a, a, a specific, you know, autoantibodies that is produced 
by this autistic kid. Next slide. And, and finally, and another very interesting uh, you know, observation that brings us back to the biofield of intestine is that you know, there have been growing evidence, uh, and this is again a recent uh, you know, paper published last year, of uh, autoimmune disturbances that may result from failed uptake of battery precursor uh, of antioxidant and terminal helium. In other words, that there is the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, in the, 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 the limitation, the capability to pick up this, uh, uh, you know, antioxidant uh, metabolites that will eventually keep everything in check and therefore reduce the, uh, the uh, inflammation that eventually can lead to uh, the onset of these autoimmune diseases. And now there's also more and more evidence that some of these metabolites can be uh, derived from bacteria and therefore this decrease of, of uptake of these metabolites may need to be part of the overall uh, pathogenesis in, together with the production of some neurotransmitters that are, you know, suboptimal. Uh, next slide. So to summarize, you know, how to connect the dots between this genetic predisposition, the environmental trigger, uh, the, the gut barrier, uh, there are several possible non mutually exclusive theories that have been uh, eventually formulated. And here, just if we focus to uh, gluten and casein as the environmental trigger, there are two major, you know, theories that have been formulated. One that uh, suggests that, you know, uh, environmental trigger like uh, casein zone and, and, and gluten may eventually uh, be uh, absorbed uh, as undigested peptides that mimic uh, because of their structure. Uh, um, the uh, function and structure of uh, endorphins, as a matter of fact, they're called diadorphins and casomorphins, and, and, and so uh, they can change the behavior of an individual in a specific genetic background and lead to uh, outcome like autism. Or there are activated inflammatory cells uh, instigated by the vascular peptide, and these activated cells may eventually leave the butterfield intestine and go to the brain and cause neuroinflammation. And again, no, there are non mutually exclusive theories. Next slide, we had the opportunity, matter of fact, to study the brain of some autistic kids at the molecular level and compare to healthy control of schizophrenic individuals. And, and surprisingly and fascinating, we found that uh, metalloproteases, the biomarkers inflammation, in this case metalloproteases 2 and 9, are significantly higher in autistic kids compared to schizophrenic individuals controls. Next slide. And we also found uh, also interesting some of the components of the tight junction that regulates the blood brain barrier to be modified, including the clotting 2, 5, and 12, while occluding another component is not, exclusively in autistic kids and not in control, meaning that not only there is a, a sign of neuroinflammation, but also an increased permeability of the blood brain barrier. Next slide. So, in, in, in conclusion, in, in essence, you know, the key points that I want to say is that, you know, both pathogenic infection and commensal seems to be in, in involved in, in induction of autoimmunity. There are individual strong family uh, history, the autoimmune disease, and more likely uh, they have uh, uh, brain reactive antibodies. Uh, these autoantibodies in peripheral blood tests and cerebral fluid, experimental fluid has been identified in these kids. Uh, and then, of course, there's this antioxidant status and redox, uh, you know, mechanism that may influence the, the formation and the action of these out antibodies. And bottom line, the combination of environmental, genetic, and maturational factors seem to be impinging on the pathogenesis of the disease. I want to spend my last three minutes, next slide, to discuss about, you know, what else is in the pipeline that shows this interact with this possible autoimmune uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, nature of, of autism. And again, uh, Chris already alluded to this uh, uh, correlated studies in 2003. This is another one in 2009 in which they made this connection. Next slide. But the key element that now is really fashionable is this microbiome and microbiome composition that seems to be instrumental for the pathogenesis of autoimmune diseases. So if I can have the next slide, you know, of all the microbiome, the one in the gut is the one that is most important. Next slide. And now we understand from the complexity of the human beings that, you know, even if we are the most sophisticated species, uh, next please, we are genetically rudimental because we are made of only 25,000 genes. 
and it's impossible to understand the complexity of our species next unless we consider that we live in symbiosis and together with a, a parallel community there is this microbiome that collectively produces 100 times more genes than we do. Next slide. So the working hypothesis, is, so bottom line, we, we as a working hypothesis are really made by two genomes. The human genome that we inherited for parents that we never change over time, and the microbiome that changed and is extremely dynamic, change from individual to individual, change in the same individual over time. And therefore, based on that, next, uh, a working uh, uh, hypothesis that we've been really exploring, thanks also to support the audience who speaks, is that, you know, the beginning of the story is the dysbiosis, so a change in the composition of the microbiome that can cause increased gut permeability, possibly through the lethal zone with an inappropriate passage of antigens. And these antigens, including gluten and casein and component microorganism, they trigger an, an immune response that, uh, you know, uh, leads to inflammation in the gut. And if the vast majority of these activated cells within the gut, these kids will develop GI symptoms that we know to be very frequent in autistic kids. If uh, the vast majority of these uh, activated cells will leave the gut and will uh, travel to the brain through the brain barrier, then we have the situation which we have mainly or exclusively behavioral symptoms and not GI symptoms. If they share, you know, either way, uh, they will eventually uh, have both GI symptoms and behavioral symptoms. Um, next um, slide, I will skip that. I will go to the next slide, please. We study the composition again of the microbiome of, of kids with autism. And what we found next slide is that indeed, uh, again, this is part of this uh, trailblazer, you know, research. We found that actually compared to healthy controls, the bad guys, the well called clostridium at the top of the slide, are increasing autistic kids, while the good guys, the bacteroid that is in the bottom, are decreased. And the ratio of the two is very unfavorable and therefore are the ones that we know to be associated to promotion of inflammation. Um, Next slide, I'm going to wrap it up and conclude that the outcome of this microbiome human genome interaction is the production of specific metabolites that can be a formidable tool to make the diagnosis of, uh, of autism because they can separate the kids that, that are healthy to siblings to the kids that have autism like the ones that you see in this red dot. So it's a very, very powerful you know, um, a way to segregate, you know, uh, the, um, uh, the 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 uh, kids without them who want it that they're not. And because we're, you know, just on time, I decided, I believe that I will stop over here so we can leave a little bit of time for uh, questions. Excellent.